Okay, and we are live. Hello, Web Shadowers. Welcome back to our second session for the spring 2021 semester. For those of you who didn't attend our first session yesterday, we've updated our guidelines a little bit. So you will now have to sign into a Google account to fill out your form just to reduce um, the amount of people that try and take it twice and that kind of thing. So this means if you don't already have a Google account, please make one as soon as you can so you're able to fill out those if you don't already have one. And along with requiring those sign-ins, we have added one more question to the Google form. So you will now have a total of four questions to, and a summary to answer and fill out. So you must earn at least a 75% on those quizzes in order to get a passing score. And also remember that your summary must be at least three sentences long. Um, finally, Web Shadowers is adding a marketing position to our team. So if you are interested in joining our team, please create a physician pre presentation sample post for us or a previous design you have made and message it to, uh, message it to us on our Instagram. Uh, we will be reviewing those submissions throughout the week. And as always, please remember the Google form will be posted in the chat box at the end of our session. So with that all being said, today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Katz, a cardiology fellow who will be teaching us all about cardiology. And Dr. Katz, you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for that intro. Uh, for anyone who's in here, I'm um, Dr. Katz, you could please call me Mark. I'm a second year cardiology fellow over at St. Luke's University Hospital <clears throat> in Bethlehem, PA. And I'm going to be trying to give you guys the presentation to show you uh, why cardiology is the best uh, specialty in medicine. And hopefully by the end of this, I'll give you guys a little bit of practical advice. I'm still in training, so I'm hoping to give you guys a little bit of practical information, getting into med school, surviving residency and whatnot. And I apologize in advance if uh, on my screen there's already a uh, cat interfering with me. She just likes to be loud and take attention whenever uh, I don't want to give it to her. Uh, but without further ado, let's just get started and jump into it. Uh, a little bit about who I am. I went to undergrad in Binghamton University, uh, graduated with BA in bio, uh, went to a Caribbean med school, Ross University in the tropical island of Dominica. Currently the uh, med school moved to uh, a different island, but still in the beautiful Caribbean. Completed my internal medicine residency at Hahnemann University Hospital, Drexel College of Medicine. Fun fact, I was one of the last graduating internal medicine residents uh, from that hospital before it shut down, unfortunately. And I am currently in my second of my three year fellowship in cardiology. Um, similarly, I know that there's a lot of questions that we might not be able to get into. I do have a YouTube page where I answered some of the most common questions like, should you attend a Caribbean med school? And I try, try to go down uh, objectively through the data of what that question really entails and then also give my own ex uh, personal opinion about it. Uh, another video about what, how I chose internal medicine, how to get into a cardiology fellowship and what a day-to-day -day life is like in fellowship. Similarly, I've got a blog, mykittycats.com, um, where I really started that to give information uh, to other medical students about how to succeed in med school. And it's expanded to include how to succeed in residency and beyond. It might not all completely be relevant to pre-med students, but I think the common theme that's very valuable on those blog posts is how to study, how to succeed in, uh, in med school. And those probably correlate also to just how to do well as a pre-med. I'm most popular on Instagram, YouTube, uh, and I'm on Twitter a little bit, but I'm more of a stalker there. Uh, and I'm at Kitty Cats MD on all, all three. Um, I'm, not on I'm not on TikTok. And if you guys have any specific questions um, I might not get to all of them, but I'm happy to uh, communicate with you guys uh, if you need me. So I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to try to make this interactive and try to get through most of it in less amount of time than more, because I know about you, but most lectures don't really need the whole hour. <laughs> My cat agrees. So the first patient that we're going to uh, talk about, and only patient we're going to talk about is a 49-year-old gentleman, history of hypertension, who comes to see me in my outpatient cardiology office, not inside the hospital. 
and he's having persistent typical chest pain. <sighs> chest pain started about two months ago when he went to the ED in the emergency department for evaluation of that chest pain. And at that time, they found that there wasn't anything immediately life threatening and that he could safely follow up with a cardiologist outside the hospital, which is what he did. So first question, I mean, this is probably if you guys have shadowed other physicians, what are some basic questions that you want to know about this guy's chest pain? And I apologize if I give it away because I'm not sure if what my next slide is, but there it is. So while you guys are thinking about what uh, uh, questions that you want to ask about this gentleman's chest pain, uh, the general philosophy that I think that we, you always have to be thinking about when you are communicating with the patient at first, when you're performing a, physical, a focused physical exam, when you're thinking about what lab tests and studies to order and what treatment modalities you're going to go through, you should always be thinking you know, the basic question of what could this possibly be? And how do I figure that out? So I try to kind of couple questions into certain diagnoses, uh, which, which I'll kind of jump into. But the basic information that we that that how doctors think and the formula. Uh, uh, um, sorry, I just saw someone lo loves pepperoni. Um, and I'm sorry, that's that's my cat's name is pepperoni pepper for short. But when she's being naughty, it's like a full pepperoni pizza. Um, so, so the way that doctors think and organize their, their information is, is spot on to what everyone's kind of getting at. HPI is the history of present illness, and it's kind of everything that you want to know about. Um, and the way I always think about this is if, if you guys went out with your friends uh, one night and you had a great time, you would tell me, first, we were at our friend's place. We had a few drinks. We went to a certain you know, show whatever it, you were with these people, what did you do before? What did you do after? Then all the extra information is probably relevant, like your friend went to the same high school as you, but it doesn't really matter about that information in the immediate setting. And all that other information is important, past medical history, surgical history, family history, social history, allergies, meds. And a lot of the, this information is you, you can't just ask the patient, like, what's your social history? because that, that's not language that they're familiar with. That's doctor language for us. And our patient doesn't have, I'll, I'll jump into the easier ones to answer, doesn't have any major cardiac history. And it's not just what do you have, but it's also important to ask those specific questions. You know, you wanna start out with an open-ended question of do you have any other past medical history, things you've been diagnosed with. That's one easy thing that I like to do is reword the same question very quickly in order to make sure that they understand fully what I'm asking. So if I were to ask them, do you have any past medical history? A layman's person might not understand what I'm asking them. So then I ask them, have you ever been diagnosed with anything, anything medical? I'll give them an example, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Have you ever had any surgeries? Do you take any medications that are prescribed by, by a physician? Similarly, all the surgical family, social allergies, meds, all those things you, you want to ask them open-ended to start but then if you're talking about someone's chest pain, I not only want to know, hey, have you ever had any surgeries? Often patients will say, no, I've never had a surgery. And then I'll say, okay, well, what's that scar in your chest? And they'll say, oh, well, that wasn't a surgery. That was just a small procedure. So their understanding of what you think a surgery might be, might be different to them. So often I'll ask them any surgical history. They say, no, I'll even ask them any thyroid issues, appendix, gallbladder, just some of the most common ones, family history. If you just ask a patient any family history of heart issues, they might say no. And more specifically, they might add things that not aren't relevant, but it's not that important if their great grandfather on their mother's side had a heart attack at age 60. I want to know first degree relatives. So I'll ask them any family history of heart disease, parents, siblings specifically. Uh, I want to know if they have any arrhythmias, uh, AFib specifically, any history of heart attacks, it's more important for uh, if they are younger, that just increases my likelihood that maybe they have a pre uh, predilection for early coronary artery disease or other cardiac issues. If someone makes it to 80 years old and has a heart attack, sure, I I'm not going to count it against my patient that I'm sure it probably will be important in their uh, family history, but it's much different than if they're a 40 year old man who had a, a heart attack. 
So I always ask about early coronary disease. Has anyone had a, a heart attack men before the age of 50, women before the age of 60, I believe, or maybe it's the opposite. Um, and similarly, allergies, any medications, new or old. So I see some uh, people going through all those things that we talked about. Um, diet is obviously very important. Um, I'm just gonna jump into uh, the, and I kind of touched on all these other things that we talked about. So I, I think everyone's kind of hitting on the HPI, the history of present illness, the things that you wanna ask about when you're talking about chest pain. Did you notice some, I'm just reading through these comments. Did you notice your pain increases after specific activities? Uh, did you ask history related for chest or heart? Exactly, that's great. Um, does the brain spread? So, so essentially everyone's kind of hitting on the most important things that you want to know about in order to ask, in order to find out what the etiology is. Whenever I get called about chest pain, obviously the reason they're calling a cardiologist is because we want to know, can it kill you? And what are the most likely things that can happen? In order to get that information, there are some very common questions that I'll ask anyone, regardless of their issue. You know, if someone comes in and they say they have abdominal pain, I'll ask very similar questions as if it's chest pain. Where is your chest pain? If it's substernal, which his was, that is more likely for it to be cardiac. When we, when we talk about cardiac chest pain, in order for it to be typical chest pain, when I say it's typical, it's most likely to be due to the heart. And when I say due to the heart, specifically I'm talking about a lack of blood flow to the heart or due to coronary artery disease. If you have three out of three questions, worse with exertion, better with rest or nitroglycerin and substernal in nature, we call it typical. If you have two of those, it's atypical. One of them, non-specific. If you have none of them, it's non-cardiac probably not uh, gonna be the person diagnosing you. But there are plenty of other structures inside the chest. And that's why you have to go through that internal medicine residency training. I, it sounds corny, but a good internist trains to be a great cardiologist. You can't, you can't skip those steps. Um, so this patient, getting back to our case, 49 year old gentleman, history of hypertension, substernal, it's worse with exertion and better with rest. Those are three out of three. This is typical chest pain. In a man, in a middle-aged man, I'm concerned right off the bat that he has some type of underlying coronary artery disease or some type of heart issues going on. He's telling me that it doesn't always happen every time his, he exerts himself, but this is one of those questions that you kind of have to peter out from, pull out from someone. You know, if they tell me I get chest pain every once in a while, sometimes I'll say, does it happen every day, every week, every month? And they'll say, yeah, it's been happening for months. And then you kind of ask yourself, well, why did you come to the doctor today? What's, what about this has changed that made you more severe? I think I get, I got back, I get back pain to, you know, quite frequently, but I don't seek a, a doctor all the time because it's not concerning to me because I knew that I hurt myself the day before. But if it's increasing in frequency, if the character of this pain changes, it makes you more concerned. It might be the reason why this person came to the doctor. So this has been increasing in duration. It's been lasting longer, it's more intense and it's happening more frequently with less exertion. And then other questions that I wanna know about are telling me about information about other diagnoses. So I kinda of wanna ask questions like, have you had a recent viral illness? Have you had any pleuritic chest pain? Pain that is worse with inspiration. Have you ever passed out? Uh, any recent uh, travel, uh, any pain in the calves or swelling, those are questions that I'm grouping together to be, could it be a pulmonary embolism? Could it be pericarditis or inflammation of the, car, uh, of the sac that surrounds the heart? So when you're asking questions, you don't, you don't want to just ask every question in the world, but you want to try to direct your questions to possible diagnoses. And that art happens with time. But essentially this guy's having pretty typical chest pain that might be cardiac in nature. And that's kind of what I, what I was uh, alluding to. So again, when I see someone in the emergency department, I mean, I'm, I'm on my heart failure service right now and I was evaluating patients. And uh, when we're consulted, the first thing that, the, the reason why I often will diagnose people with non-life-threatening issues is because they often think what can kill you and then what's most likely. Those are the two columns of things that I always ask about. And I think if you're in the emergency departments or many other specialties, there's six causes of chest pain that you don't wanna miss. So can anyone name 
six causes of chest pain that can kill you today. Like right now, you're walking into the emergency department or my office. I want to make sure you don't have that because you can die imminently. And then you can also throw out while we're at it, six other common causes of chest pain that are not life-threatening and frankly are not cardiac in nature. And when you're thinking about this, just think about all the stuff in your chest. The heart isn't the only organ that's in your chest. So what are some other things that can kill you and things that can uh, cause chest pain? Heart attack, boom, that's one of them most obvious. And the thing with heart attacks is you can be having one right this second and it's a little bit more typical. This guy's, if it was a heart attack, it shouldn't be just going away. His chest pain shouldn't go away if we didn't do anything. We can give you some medicines and maybe it'll make better, make it better. But if you're having a true heart attack, which is 100% occlusion of an artery by a small clot in the heart, your chest pain isn't just gonna go away. Heart attack number one, PE, pulmonary embolism, certainly can kill you. STEMI or an ST elevation MI, that's another way to, that's a scientific way to say you're having a, a heart attack. Very true. Blocked artery, again, that's the uh, pathophysiology of what causes a heart attack. It's really, a, uh, and I actually have a great YouTube video on this. If you look on my uh, page for adrenal depilotherapy after drug eluting stent, it really goes through the pathophysiology of what happens during a heart attack. GERD, anxiety, great ones for the non-cardiac chest pain ones. Stroke, I'm going to say that you're not wrong. But typically, when you think of a stroke, it can, it can certainly kill you, but it's really not going to be causing you chest pain that is going to cause a stroke. You can have arteries in your neck that are, are occluded, carotid arteries that uh, can in, cause a stroke, but it wouldn't really be causing chest pain. Aortic dissection, boom, that's another one. And one of the, there are two more that are really tough uh, that you guys might not get. One of them is, oh, we talked about dissection, whoops. Um, internal bleeding. Internal bleeding can happen, but it's, again, it's not gonna be causing chest pain that's killing you right now. I mean, sure, if someone stabs you in the chest, you'll be bleeding internally. Um, one of them is gonna involve the lungs. I'll give you pneumothorax, boom. Pneumothorax is a uh, dropped lung that can kill you if you don't uh, fix it immediately. And there's one other that's always the toughest to get. It has to do with the esophagus. And I'll be impressed if anyone knows the medical term for the, uh, what I'll say is an esophageal rupture. So the six causes of chest pain that can kill you right now, Aortic dissection, this is again, just trying to show you guys what it actually is. And aortic, I don't know if you guys can see the uh, cursor on, on the screen, but aortic dissection is simply a tear in the intima or the lining of the aorta. And the biggest issue with this is A, you can, it can burst, it can rupture. And then two, it can also cause a whole lot of other issues. So this can certainly be an immediate life-threatening issue. And I'll tell you the number one thing, test that you can do and number one thing you can do to save your patient's life is get a good history and physical because a good history taking an understanding how their chest pain character is can help you save someone's life for instance an aortic dissection classically on the test or in the textbook is going to have back pain a uh, chest pain that radiates straight to the back and has a tearing sensation that's because sometimes you can literally have uh the aorta feel like it's tearing because that's what a dissection truly is in order to diagnose a dissection, you have to do a CTA or a CT scan uh, with contrast to look at the aorta, or you can do a transesophageal echo where we take an echo probe and go down the esophagus and look at the proximal part of the aorta to diagnose this. And if you give this person who's having a dissection a blood thinner, you can kill them. However, the treatment for a heart attack is to give some blood thinners. So in order to and, and sometimes it's not, it, it sounds as it sounds a lot simpler, you know, just scan them or do a good physical, but sometimes boom. Oh, wow. I'm impressed if someone actually knew Gorhaves uh, and didn't Google it. Um, but I am impressed gold star to whoever had Borhaves. Uh, that's just the esophageal rupture. But all I'm getting at is if I could make you guys uh, understand one thing, it's all these tests are great, but it's always guided by a good history and physical exam.
Second one, pneumothorax, collapsed lung. Got to toss a needle in there and let the air out, put it in a chest tube. I do not do that stuff, thank God. Borhaves, this is just the esophageal rupture, CT scan, this black is the lung. And this is just esophageal stuff, uh, uh, contents of the esophagus and uh, stuff that's supposed to be in the stomach that's spilling out into uh, the lung space. Myocardial infarction, this up top is what an EKG looks like when it's obvious. To be honest, it's sometimes it's easy. You look at an EKG, someone's having chest pain, boom, you're having a, card, you're having a, uh, uh, a heart attack. Um, and on, but sometimes it's, it's not quite that simple. There's some other mimickers and there's one other thing that can kill you that we didn't mention that can also mimic it. And on the bottom here is a, uh, left heart catheterization where we take a catheter going through the wrist or the, or the groin, the femoral artery, thread a catheter smaller than the size of a coffee straw up to the aorta up around the, uh, arch of the aorta, spray some contrast dye under active fluoroscopy or x-ray. Look at the arteries, see that there's an occlusion. This is the before and then after when we open up, open it up with a nice stent. And tamponade, this is the only other one that we missed. I even forgot about it when I was, and I'm presenting. But th these are things that kind of eventually come intuitively. Cardiac tamponade, uh, this, this image is an echo or an ultrasound of the heart. Um, you'll have to take my word for it, but this black stuff where it says effusion on the left-hand side above the right atrium, and the effusion above the right ventricle and down here, pericardial effusion, not supposed to be there. And the issue with the pericardial effusion is uh, it causes the heart to not be able to expand appropriately. It's kind of like if you take a balloon and put it underwater, that balloon is just gonna be compressed and not able to expand fully. And that's what happens with the heart is when the, a lot of fluid gets into the pericardial space, the pericardium is a, is, is, a, is a piece of connective tissue that surrounds the heart that normally doesn't cause issue. If it becomes inflamed, this space can uh, fill up with fluid. The issue actually isn't how much fluid, but it's how fast it fills up. So I've had patients who have unfortunately have cancer and it slowly bleeds into the pericardium because the tumor invades into there and they are slowly bleeding a small amount into the pericardial space every day. And we've drained like a liter and a half out of a pericardial effusion. But if you take you or I and put 150 milliliters into that pericardial space, because it's so sudden and our heart's not used to it and we're not able to change our hemodynamics and change our cardiac output and heart rate and blood pressure to adapt to that, it can be immediately life-threatening. So it's not only how much fluid, but it's also how fast it, 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 uh, it developed. And the last thing is a pulmonary embolism. Um, I, I'm, a non, I, I'm planning on being a non-invasive cardiologist, so echo is something that I enjoy doing um, and interpreting. Uh, if you look at this past image, you can see how the right ventricle, the, the left ventricle is supposed to be this big chunky thing. If you can see on the bottom space, it's nice and thick. That's because it has to pump against a blood pressure of you know 120 over 80, whereas the right ventricle pumps against a low pressure system in the lungs. The way you breathe is you, you increase volume, thus decreasing pressure. So the right ventricle gets to pump against a pressure of like 25 over 10. So when you have a, a pulmonary embolism or a huge clot, you're causing the right ventricle to pump against a tremendous amount of pressure. And that's what causes this right ventricle to blow, kind, kind of blow up and get a whole lot bigger. And that's what we can see on a pulmonary embolism when they're very obvious. But again, it's not always this easy. If I looked at that one, boom, pulmonary embolism or something with the RV. Um, kind of went over this beat, beaten dead horse at this point, but figuring out this in this stuff, it sounds easy, uh, but you really just got to uh, get a good history and physical. Nothing will ever replace a good history and physical exam. Six other common causes of chest pain. You guys did a really good job of hitting most of them. Pneumonia. Pneumonia can cause chest pain, pleuritic type of pain. Um, obviously, someone's going to have symptoms of coughing, fever, chills. There are certain patients who might not have those classic symptoms. But even if someone sounds like they might have a heart attack, I still ask them any fever, chills, uh, positive sputum, sick contacts, recent travel. Uh, one of the most common reasons that I see people is musculoskeletal pain or costochondritis. I had a 20 year old who was referred to cardiology and he had just been working out his chest and his chest started to hurt. He never really worked out extensively and he didn't, you know, he was very concerned. 
if you just have generalized inflammation, there's a whole lot of other structures in your chest and connective tissue. If they get inflamed, it can be quite painful. GERD, gastric esophageal reflux or acid reflux. Asthma, COPD, that's one of the other reasons that people can sometimes have chest pain. Pericarditis, that's inflammation of the pericardial sac that can lead to tamponade, but not the only cause of tamponade and anxiety. I always try to uh, take your patient's word. You got to listen to your patient and respect that whatever they're telling you is the truth. You can suspect that maybe they're not completely um, always truthful with you, but I think that's when you get into more trouble. I would rather take my patient's word 100% and listen to them and trust what they're having and rule out other possible causes while you're talking to them. And sometimes it does end up being anxiety, but you can still make sure that this pain isn't something more sinister with some other types of tests. So what type of tests, if this person is sitting in your office, they're not dying actively, but they have very concerning symptoms for maybe a blockage in the artery. You know, a heart attack happens when it's 100% blocked, but if you have a 99% blockage or atherosclerosis or a narrowing of the blood flow of the heart, you might be developing these symptoms that increase your risk of a heart attack. So kind of gave it away. All right, well, that's right. I think I saw someone say a stress test. <laughs> So uh, a stress test is essentially a, a non-invasive way and a surrogate wet marker of evaluating someone's coronary blood flow or blood flow to the heart. The definitive way to figure that out is with a left heart catheterization, which I kind of mentioned before, and we saw that image of, but you don't want to send everyone to that test. You only want to do that for people who have a high clinical index of suspicion. A stress test is good for those people who are kind of in the middle. Similarly, uh, you don't want to send people who you have a very low clinical suspicion to a stress test. You don't want to send some, because you always have to ask yourself, what am I going to do with this information after the fact? For instance, if, if I walked into a cardiologist's office and I had chest pain, it would be foolish to send me for a stress test in someone who's low risk and unlikely to have a heart attack or have significant atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis, because what if that test is positive? Are you gonna then send me for another unnecessary test and a catheterization? So some of the testing that you guys mentioned is spot on. I wanna get an EKG to see, is there evidence of an old heart attack? If there's signs of a heart attack imminently, I would then send them straight to the, cat, to the hospital and cath lab. You don't want it, again, I kind of went through why you don't want to do straight to a calf. Ultrasound, I think that's one of the first things that we also do is uh, see is there damage of the uh, muscle of the heart. An ultrasound or an echo of the heart tells us how the heart muscle is functioning as well as how the valves are opening and closing. And a chest x-ray is also a good idea. We probably will get some basic labs just to make sure there's nothing more sinister going on. Chest x-ray is also a great way to help rule out a pneumonia. Although in this patient, I don't have a high index of suspicion, but if maybe they're having fever and chills and we weren't in the middle of a pandemic and they just had an exposure, I certainly might wanna get a chest x-ray to rule that out. So the way that we do various uh, stress, stress tests is you have to first stress the patient and then image them. So the two main ways that we stress patients and just to make a side point, just the way that we communicate with our patients, I'll tell them that you have, you, we're going to send you for a stress test. And a patient will tell me, well, I'm very stressed already. I don't know if I should go through one. And that's just an example of the language you use with your patients. You have to convey colloquially. I, I will often convey <clears throat> that it is a physiologic stress test. And the purpose of it is to increase the myocardial oxygen demand. You want them to get their heart rate up. Pharmacological stress tests and an exercise stress test, we throw them on the tread, toss them on the treadmill and they walk at uh, like a 10% hill. So it's pretty steep. And every three minutes we increase the speed and increase the incline. It's actually pretty tough. And a pharmacological stress test, we use a different way to try and do the same thing, but a little bit differently.
And then when you are stressing them, you want to find out, are there, is there any sign of ischemia? We can do that with an EKG. We often couple that with an echo. And sometimes we can use a nuclear imaging. The difference specifically between an echo or uh, echocardiography and an ultrasound is that every echo is an ultrasound, not every ultrasound is an echo. Basically an echo, echocardiography is a ultrasound of the heart. But you can do an ultrasound of everything. You can, you can use an ultrasound to image your abdomen, your lungs, emergency uh, medicine physicians, ICU physicians, uh, rheumatologists, Use, the, use an ultrasound to image a variety of different uh, body parts, but echocardiography is a specific uh, type of ultrasound to the heart. So this is just a, a quick image. We did not do this for this patient because he was able to exercise and had a normal EKG. Uh, so often we will use this type of test for people who, you know, if, if you don't have, uh, if you've had an amputation, it's gonna be very hard for you to exercise enough to get your heart rate up. Or if you have severe osteoarthritis and it's painful to run. There are, there's a variety of reasons why we would use a nuclear stress test. And this is kind of what we're doing. On the left-hand side, you can see the different cuts of how we're taking the uh, heart. And it's basically like if you take the heart and we take an image like this and then like that and rotate the heart and look at it in a different view. And then on the right-hand side, you can kind of see that that image is the computerized uh, way that we interpret. Um, we actually use a radio tracer and um, inject it into the patient and compare rest and stress images. Again, this is not what we did for our patient. This is from a different one. Um, but you can see the top images are the stress and the bottom are the rest. Uh, there are one, two, three, four different groups of them. And it's looking at different sections of the heart and we're looking for mis perfusion mismatches. But this is just one of the mechanisms that we will image the heart. What we chose for our patient is a stress echo. So we got him on the treadmill, he's uh, walking. We have EKG leads on him. And then after he gets to his peak heart rate, which is, 200, which is his 210 minus his age uh, times 85 or 85%. Uh, so if you're 20 years old, that'd be 210 minus 20, which is 190 and whatever that 85% of that is, we wanna get you to that heart rate and then image the, image the heart with the ultrasound. Um, typically uh, for whenever I send a patient for an echo, a tech will be doing that. They perform the echo themselves it's my responsibility as the cardiologist to interpret it. That's what we're kind of, we, we are trained in order to do the echo ourselves. In fellowship, when I'm overnight in the hospital, I'll often be called to come do an echo because I'm the one who's uh, trained to do it and I'm uh, in training. So the more experience I can get, the better. But in clinical practice, the reason that we go through three years of cardiology fellowship is because we're the experts in interpreting it so they, the, the, the technicians are so valuable and a, you can't replace a good tech, they're amazing. Um, they're the ones who are acquiring the images. We're the ones who are interpreting them. Um, that being said, w w often with stress tests, we'll be right there with the technician performing the stress test and supervising it. So with the stress test, the first section that we wanna look at is the baseline stress. So this is an EKG just while he's sitting there. I'll just, <laughs> You'll have to take my word for it, but it's normal. This is his peak exercise. So what we look for is ST depressions. The S segment, S is a part of this big chunky uh, part of the uh, EKG where it's the ventricle that's uh, uh, contracting. And that's the electrical signal of the heart contracting. And this part right here is a little bit depressed. And then when we kept him going, he started actually getting those symptoms of chest pain and these ST depressions, which can signify uh, ischemia got worse. This is quite concerning. And this is also a good note of pretest probability and sensitivity and specificity. 
that if we were to say that every single person who has slight ST depressions on EKG during a stress test went for a calf, then a lot of people would have false positive stress tests. And uh, that's just part of choosing the right test for the right patient. If you increase the, the um, cutoff for a stress test, you're gonna get a higher specificity meaning that anyone who has a positive stress test is most likely to be having it, but you're gonna miss some patients. So it's, it's hard to say that there's one specific thing, but in this patient, this is a concerning EKG. You'll have to just take my word for it, but he's also having these typical symptoms, which is also concerning. And again, this is just trying to show you guys that if you, uh, I hope you can see my cursor, but um, on the left-hand side, you can see the segment is very flat and it's like this, this baseline is one flat line over here. This is the baseline and then it goes down and then it goes back up here and then it's down. This is concerning. So we sent him for a left heart cath procedure. Uh, hopefully this plays, but this is again, the procedure that I was talking about where we take uh, a catheter. Ah, oh, shoot. this plays. So we take a small needle, pop it into the artery, thread a wire over it, uh, put a catheter over it, take out the wire, and uh, eventually thread the wire up to the heart. This is what the cath actually looks like on imaging. This right here is the wire itself that we're guiding down and spraying the contrast in. This right here is that blockage in the right coronary artery. First step is uh, opening it up with a balloon angiography. And this is stent deployment. Again, this is not our patient. This is just showing you the tests that we do. This is what interventional cardiologists do. So if you wanna do that for a living, be the person that gets called in for heart attacks, you have to do another year of training. So four years of med school, three years of internal medicine, three years of uh, fellowship, and then another year of interventional cardiology. Too much for me. I'm happy to call someone else in to do that. But you got to just think about trade-offs with lifestyle. You know, they get paid the most in medicine up there with orthopedic surgeons. But I don't care to do that. It's not going to make me happier. Uh, caths, catheterizations do certainly go in to through the thigh. We go in through the femoral artery. That's where they were actually pioneered. That's the first artery that we used to do. Um, and sometimes you have to just based on the anatomy, not being able to get through um, everyone's anatomy is a little bit different. Some people's radial arteries are very small. Sometimes they have kinks and we can't maneuver it because when you're, when you're really maneuvering it, you're, you're basically taking a wire. You're basically taking a wire that's downstream in the patient and turning it in order to try to move it. So it can be very difficult if someone has a very torturous artery. Uh, the procedure doesn't really hurt. I've never had it done, so I'm sure my patients might disagree, but really it shouldn't. The most painful part of the procedure should be anesthesia, just getting some lidocaine injection. And after that, we use conscious sedation. You're not intubated or, or under general sedation. We use uh, uh, anxiolytics and pain meds to kind of knock you out and put you in a twilight. Um, and then we kind of wake you up afterwards. The worst part is that you got to lay flat if we go in through the groin for about six hours and your wrist can kind of hurt. This is what our patient's left heart catheterization looked like. And um, just use your imagination a little bit. You can kind of see that on this one, there aren't any obvious gaping blockages. Uh, if you remember the other one from the video, there was like an artery and then a stunted part and then the artery continued. Uh, and this is just the heart but we rotate it, uh, uh, the camera around the patient in the cath lab to look at it from different vantage points. So the patient's laying flat on the table and the camera will kind of rotate around in order to look at the patient from a different angle in order to lay out the arteries in different ways. And what you'll have to take my word for is that this is a normal coronary artery, uh, left, heart, left coronary artery. Uh, and then this is the right coronary artery. Again, no obvious luminal irregularities. Pepperoni agrees. And uh, he came back to follow up after that left heart catheterization. So why do we go through the wrist and not further up the arm? 
Um, if you thrump, there's no there's no reason to go to go higher up. Um, the 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 radial artery uh, is is big enough to allow us to go in. Um, it's more pain. Just think about it, if anyone's ever had an IV placed. Um, they they actually used to go in through the brachial artery, and you you still can, but you don't really want to start out up here because if you mess something up up here, you then have to kind of work your way up. So if you mess something up over here, you can kind of move up the artery. If you start out up here, you're kind of screwed and kind of have to go even further or you're stuck onto the, to the, um, to the fem or the femoral artery in the groin. It's also just a little bit of uh, uh, stabilization. After the catheterization, we use a, uh, a pressure device that just kind of clamps around the wrist and it's really easy. Uh, it deflates over, you know, we remove some air over a couple hours and it's just easier to take care of the patient when the insertion point is right here versus up the arm. A lot of patients are also a little bit bigger and there's just less tissue to get to the artery over here in the wrist compared to up in the arm. It's just easier access. You know, don't make, don't make your life harder than it has to be. So this patient came back to the, uh, to our office. He had in addition to a normal cath, we did a Zeo patch. A Zeo patch is a uh, monitor uh, that actually just goes on the chest. You click a button every time uh, that um, you feel symptoms. We also use this just to monitor how many extra heartbeats you might have. Um, I, I go into more detail about this on a blog post uh, about what we use for palpitations. But just to say that he wasn't, uh, the point of this was that he wasn't having any significant uh, arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms that were causing these symptoms as well. And we kind of already knew that because he went through the left heart catheterization and we saw those EKG changes with the chest pain and there were no abnormal heart rhythms. Um, but it's strange. This isn't a typical case. Normally someone has typical symptoms. We do the catheterization and, and boom, wow, he has a blocked artery. Let's open it up and it'll feel better. But he had an abnormal stress test, but a normal left heart cath. It just doesn't make any sense. So what do we do now? This is where you got to kind of be a doctor and, and think to yourself, well, what's going on? This patient's still having symptoms. I can put him on some medications to maybe treat coronary artery disease, but he's having very concerning symptoms. If this was your, your mom or dad, that's how you always got to think about it, is if this was your parent, what would you do? Um, and frankly, this is also, along with always get a good history and physical, this next part uh, is my second gem of the night is always look at your own images. Because when we looked at our images, the, re the report from the left heart cath, because I'm not the one doing this, I sent my patients to get a left heart catheterization and an interventional cardiologist is the one doing the procedure. They don't know the patient as well. They get a brief history and they understand why they're getting the procedure, but they don't go into as much detail maybe. So we took my, my attending and I took a look at these images and what you'll have to <clears throat> take my word for is that this catheter is kind of just, it looks like it's not quite in the right place. You know, the coronary arteries are the first arteries that come off of the aorta and they're supposed to come off in typical spots, kind of the right side and the left side, the right and left coronary artery. And in order to get our catheter, we kind of go down and you kind of know where it's supposed to go and the right coronary, it's supposed to kind of point the other way. It's supposed to kind of point to the right, not to the left. And this kind of just looks a little different than it's supposed to be. He also, so, so we went back and also looked at some of his CT scans. He had a CT scan for a different reason, but we used that information as best as we could. So this is just going from the top of the patient down in, in slices. Uh, this is the uh, heart in the middle, and that's what we're kind of trying to focus on. But specifically, this is kind of what we want to look at is the coronary arteries. And um, if you can kind of see both of them, this big guy, and then this artery kind of both originate over here. And it just looks a little off. It doesn't look right. Uh, this again is just the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. And normally they come off one over here and one over here. It just, just something doesn't seem right. 
So we did a CT, a, what we call a CTA or a coronary uh, angiogram where we do a CT scan of the chest and we inject the dye uh, peripherally and time it to look at the coronary arteries. This is uh, uh, another view of the right coronary artery. And the reason we do this isn't to look at look for blockages in the artery. That's why we do the left heart catheterization. This is more so to lay out the anatomy of it. Um, and these are just like, I think really cool images that we're really looking at the coronary artery. This is just, I mean, we don't, I don't use this um, uh, clinically, but this is just the computer algorithm that kind of pops out what the layout of the coronary arteries look like. And then this is just the beautiful picture of the most important organ in the body. And what you can kind of tell right here, I mean, you'll have to take my word for it and use a little bit of imagination, is that this right here is the right coronary artery and it's coming off right where the left coronary artery is supposed to. Really this right coronary artery should be coming out, uh, originating off of the aorta much more laterally, which is just abnormal. So, and hold on, these are just again, those same images. And this is what I'm trying to really uh, uh, show you guys is the origin of the right coronary artery right there. This, this is the same artery, just uh, the heart is being rotated a little bit in our view so we can view it better. And I, I think you guys can kind of make out this artery and it kind of snakes up here and the origins up here. That is completely not normal. And what we ultimately diagnosed this patient was with an anomalous right coronary artery. So this is just a classic case of very typical symptoms for a blockage in the artery of the heart concerning, you know, if he walked into the emergency department, emergency department, if I was an ED doctor, I would say this guy might be having a heart attack right now. We did the appropriate testing, but it ended up not being what we thought it was. And he actually had to undergo open heart surgery for a unroofing procedure. And I'll go into a little bit of detail of that that's when we send him to CT surgeons, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon way back in the day Then I spent one day in the operating room and knew that it was not for me. I just don't have the attention span to sit there and like do surgery for like six hours at a time. Uh, but you have to fix this generally. The three ways that you can fix it, you can use a stent, but it's not really that great. Uh, or you can do an unbuttoning procedure where you literally take the origin of the uh, coronary artery and move it somewhere else higher up on the, on the uh, aorta. Or you can do an unroofing procedure. And that's what this guy got. Oh, I gave it away. So this is a diagram of what, the, uh, what I'm talking about all the way on the left-hand side on A. This is what it's supposed to look like. The left coronary artery coming off the left coronary cusp. This is the aorta here. Coming off the left-hand side, the right coronary going on the right-hand side. Goes into the right place. Anatomy looks beautiful. This is a left anomalous coronary artery with our, where the origin of the left comes off of the right. And this right here is what our patient had, where the right coronary artery comes off of the origin where the left coronary comes. He did have this since birth. Often this can manifest, uh, you know, randomly in middle age. Um, there's no real screening tool for this, but it's something that is rare, but you have to think about as a cardiologist. Um, an, unroo an unroofing procedure is where you literally uh, open, do it's open heart surgery and they uh, basically open up the ostium or the opening of the artery. So the issue with, the, with, with a uh, anomalous coronary artery is that the artery goes transluminally. So it's in, it travels inside the lumen and can kind of get compressed. And that's probably what was happening is this gentleman could get enough blood flow, but sometimes when he was exerting himself, there might be a little bit of a compression for whatever reason. Maybe it was from uh, the... Uh, tensile strength of the aorta that literally is pumping as he's exercising and it causes a lack of blood flow. So the origin is over here and this is the course of the artery and they basically kind of cut it open so that there will be less of a blood, less of a possibility for him to have a blockage. Why did it only show up now? Don't know. It just did. Um, it's uncommon for it to really happen in uh, younger kids, but uh, this is just another possible uh, manifestation 
um, of uh, people having very serious chest pain. Uh, that is a rare case that I saw. Um, to be honest, I don't know why it only showed up now. I can try to find a literature review and find out um, what the most common reason for uh, presentations. Maybe he just got older um, and it just finally happened. I really don't know why today it decided to uh, manifest. Procedure, basically, the, a left heart calf takes less than an hour. Uh, that This one probably took 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, open heart surgery, the longest part is getting someone on pump or bypass. Um, that takes, you know, getting, opening anesthesia, opening the chest, uh, uh, getting all the stuff out of the way, putting the patient on bypass, and then getting to the heart. That takes like an hour. And then doing that in reverse on the way out takes another hour. And then it takes another hour of time. So it ends up being like a six hour procedure. It's, it's open heart surgery. It, it's probably a little bit less time. That's about how long a uh, coronary artery bypass takes, maybe four hours or so. I'm not a surgeon. I don't do these procedures every day or ever, I should say. Um, if I didn't, if we didn't catch this, he likely would have dropped dead. That's the other way that uh, we discovered these is through, um, uh, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, these were also discovered post-mortem. So they often happen during Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the word for um, when they examine the body after they're dead. A, not obituary, geez, it's been a long day. Um, but essentially we found these in uh, patients who had already died, maybe not from this. Often you can have other types of coronary artery anomalies that aren't deadly, but this one certainly can be. Um, so that's just basically all of our case and just hopefully some information about cardiology and the wide array of stuff that we do and see. Um, so I just wanted to go through some basic stuff that I wish I knew in undergrad. The first thing was just learn to study correctly. I figured out how to study in med school um, and I wish I learned how to study a little bit earlier. What I mean by that is uh, in, in college, you can kind of get away with uh, digesting everything and regurgitating it for the test. In med school, you will drown and not make it if you do that because everything that you learn from day one is important uh, up and up through graduation because you have to learn it and apply it on your uh, standardized tests. So you have to understand it. And that's really the crux of it is if you understand something, it makes it easier to, to remember it. Uh, and the other thing that I would take it a step further for is if you guys are, depending on where you are in your uh, pre-med track, I would study for, you know, Chem 101, which I took uh, intro like uh, freshman year because I was a bio major and I had to take it. Study all of those courses as if you're studying for the MCAT. That way, when you're seeing a seeing uh, a studying for the MCAT, you're not doing this for the first time and you can keep your mind on the long-term goal. And then the last thing that I just hope you guys uh, understand is just getting into med school isn't the end of the road. Uh, really getting uh, a residency is the most important thing because there was a common uh, comic in my undergrad and they said, what do you call someone who graduates at the bottom of their med school class? And they used to say doctor, but really the answer is unemployed because if you graduate med school but fail to complete a residency, you can't be a doctor and you're just in six figures worth of debt but you can call yourself doctor. You have to complete a residency program in order to uh, practice as a physician in the US. So just be aware that getting into med school isn't just the first, isn't the only hurdle, but really the long-term goal is getting into a residency program. Um, I see some people just asked, have you seen any cardio symptoms related to COVID? We see a whole lot of, whole lot of people with COVID, uh, some myocarditis or inflammation of the heart uh, muscle, some uh, pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardial sac. A lot of people who are uh, septic dying um, who also have cardiac, not cardiac involvement, but just their body is under such physiologic stress that there's also damage happening to the heart. Um, what made me specialize in cardiology? Um, well, I chose internal medicine because I hated everything else. 
but I really, the real reason is because I wanted to be someone's doctor. I wanted to be that classic doctor who kind of is able to do a little bit of everything. I didn't like the procedures of surgery, but I knew I wanted to be able to do some type of procedures. And I was always drawn to cards. Um, I thought I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, but after I went through surgery, I realized that just, it wasn't for me. I didn't want to do that. And I didn't enjoy the environment. I didn't enjoy the culture of surgery, but I love the physiology. I was a physics TA in college um, and cardiology just kind of makes sense to me and I enjoy doing it um, and I'm good at it. Uh, so it kind of, and I was also a gross anatomy TA in, in uh, um, med school. So I think it just, that combination drew me to cardiology and then the breadth and depth and really the scope of stuff that we do in the testing and treatment modalities and cardiology, I think is what really drew me to it in that it's really, to me, the precipice of the advancement of tech and science that we can save someone's life today, uh, that there's people who can be walking into the hospital close to death. And a week later, they'll be walking out of the hospital, you know, saying thank you. Um, and that's really what I love about uh, medicine in general is just being able to help people through their most sometimes emotionally or physically naked moments of their lives and know that they have an advocate with them and help them get through those moments. Um, and now increasingly alone in the hospital, but them and their family. Um, tips on preventing burnout. Um, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think that our medical system is broken. It relies on the empathy of physicians and, uh, to overwork us. I, I think in order to prevent burnout, we really need to get physicians into positions of leadership in hospitals and in legislation in order to improve the how we're able to practice medicine. More realistically, I think in order to prevent burnout, you just have to every day try to not let the little things bother you. There are going to be people who are jerks who you work with, patients who are jerks to you. But there are little moments where you can still take pride in your work. You can still enjoy the time at work um, and try to make sure that you don't get lost in medicine. You know, med school and pre-med, you know, I'm still training. And, uh, you know, you have to sacrifice a whole lot in order to uh, get through this whole process. Just don't get lost in it and don't forget who helped you along the way, whether it's friends, family or significant other. Uh, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds uh, and lose sight of the forest for the trees. Um, MCAT study tips, to be honest, uh, I took the MCAT twice, got a 25 and then a 29. Um, so my overall MCAT study tips is when you are in college and you're taking those courses for the first time, study them to understand the concepts. You, you're gonna have to memorize some random useless information for your test and get, you know, do that so you can get the A in the test and a good GPA, but understand the stuff, use practice questions to uh, apply your knowledge and try to start studying for your MCAT from day one. Um, can you go into detail about what you meant the surgery? Surgery culture is just uh, very um, kind of, mi not militaristic, but it's very hierarchical. Uh, I just don't thrive in that type of environment. You know, uh, internal medicine is a little bit more laid back. We round, we talk, surgery um, just has that classic culture of like old medicine where you get yelled at all the time and you're in the hospital by five, you know, by 5 a.m. and it's just, it's not for me. Uh, were you involved in research during undergrad? No, that is why, also why I went to a Caribbean med school. Not the only reason. Frankly, I uh, in undergrad, I just didn't know I wanted to be a doctor until the beginning of my junior year, and I dug myself a hole for my GPA. That's why I ended up going to Caribbean med school, because A, I knew what I wanted to do, didn't want to take time off in order to do a post-grad, um, uh, post like uh, improve my GPA or whatnot. And I finally just knew that I was knew what I wanted to do. Ross University, it gave me a yes, and it made all the other 28 um, no's not worth it. So uh, I was rejected by like 27 med schools, both MD and DO. They're the same thing, doesn't matter. Um, and what I mean by that is that the, there's, I don't care about the prestige, like every MD and DO, a good doctor is a good doctor. It doesn't matter. For all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. Um, so I didn't do any research in undergrad, but I think you certainly should, um, or at least 
that's what they want to see on your CV. So do what you got to do. Um, what aspects of this field do you enjoy the most? And what do you not like and wish you could change? I wish they would pay me more and that I could do less work, really. You know, I think that's the goal is get paid a lot to do not that much. Um, but, but realistically, really my favorite part of cardiology is I love the medicine. I love that cardiology has a lot of huge trials. You know, like there's a lot of medicines that we give to people after a heart attack, for instance, that have been really well studied and they've, they've been proven to keep people alive longer. Um, and there's just something beautiful about being able to, you know, have a patient being close to, close to dying and being able to look them in the eye and say like, we're gonna take care of this together. I'm here for you. And, you know, being able to watch them walk out of the hospital. Um, you know, the, like one, it's sad, but it all only takes one thank you a day, like a heartfelt thank you from a patient to make my day. Um, whether that's an, a, a testament to how, <laughs> uh, how burnt out I am or how, uh, how little people uh, express their appreciation, maybe a little bit of both. Um, and what do I not like the most? Um, I think what I don't like the most isn't mostly about cardiology. It's more so just about medicine in general, um, that a lot of uh, it is becoming a little bit more cookie cutter that, um, you know, I think that people should just take pride in their work and uh, not practice defensive medicine, but our system is a little bit broken and it makes it makes our lives a little bit more difficult than they have to be. But overall, I, I do enjoy what I do. Oh, uh, you mentioned that anxiety can be a common cause. You mentioned anxiety can be a common source of chest pain and other concerning symptoms. How do you differentiate a panic attack, anxiety attack from cardiac condition? Um, acutely, EKG, see if there's any ischemic changes. Get a troponin, which is a protein found inside the cells of the heart. Whenever the cells of the heart die, whether it's from a heart attack or getting kicked in the chest by a horse, those proteins from the dead cells leak into the blood. We can pick that up in your in, on a blood test. We check it every three hours in order to evaluate the um, sim, the uh, severity of a heart attack. Uh, you can be having a heart attack and have uh, heart cells start to die, but if you take your blood test right at that moment, you're gonna have a negative blood test. That's why we take it through at least three times over uh, nine hours um, in order to differentiate if it's a panic attack versus, you know, people can have a panic attack and also be having a heart attack. So sometimes it's not as simple as, um, uh, symptoms, but you really got to take, um, into account all those other little things. Uh, why did you decide to go to Caribbean med school? Because I got in, uh, but also again, kind of what I mentioned was, uh, that they gave me the chance to go into medicine, which the 27 other schools didn't. And I knew what I wanted to do. Didn't want to delay. And, uh, I, all, I go into a lot more detail in my YouTube video. Um, if you, if you want to check, check that out. Do you think studying medicine has limited you in your personal social life? Yes. Such as maybe having to delay having kids, marriage, losing friends. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, you have to sacrifice in medicine. I've missed many um, uh, personal life events of friends and family um, because I had to, you know, study or, you know, my family went on vacation and I was working in the ICU in residency. Um, but it's, a sacrifice you have to make. Um, how much clinical experience do you have before med school? I shadowed a gastroenterologist for like two months. What did you want to do before junior year of college and what ultimately drew you to medicine? To be honest, I don't remember. I feel like I just wanted to go into, I, I think I wanted to go into maybe a startup for uh, biotech for stem cell research. Um, I had a great mentor who um, had a biotech over there and I saw like stem cells from a, a cardiac myocyte like beating that they create that they you know uh, duplicated so I thought maybe I would do something like that but I wasn't really that passionate about it and something just clicked and I realized like hmm I'll be a doctor um the only other things that I had here is uh buy the dip and hold if you don't know now you know um Another thing, uh, the good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. William Osler, Mark Katz. Hopefully that's also a throwback. Someone hopefully caught that office reference, but also a, uh, a nod to not take yourself too seriously. 
Um, I really recommend these books, uh, Being Mortal uh, by Tsul Gawande. He's one of my favorite authors. He just talks about the medical system and death and dying. Um, when Breath Becomes Air, it's about a neurosurgeon who's at the last year of his training and then he gets cancer and uh, just gets tissues ready. And Patients at Risk is a really interesting new book that's uh, just about the medical system that I think would be valuable for you guys to understand the system that you're going to be a part of in, the, in moving forward. And uh, I think I kind of mentioned it, you know, I love my job, but residency is the best thing I would never do again. I think if someone told me like I could be a doctor, but I have to redo my residency, I would tell you no thank you. I, I half jokingly say that just to say that, uh, you know, being in tent, your guys are going to follow attending physicians probably and most of the people who probably are, are presenting our attendings, um, you know, who I, what I will be in a year and a half after I finish fellowship. But the training truly is rigorous and it, it has to be. You can only read about doing a push-up so much. You, you got to go out and get, you get your reps in. And I loved it. It was amazing, but it's daunting um, and it can be tough. And I just want you guys to be aware of the sacrifice that you do need to put in. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, it was worth it uh, because I really do love what I do. And I think that's it. Again, those are my Insta handles and email. I'm happy to st uh, hang on if anyone has any other questions. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Katz. This was an absolutely wonderful presentation. Everyone learned so much. I know I certainly did. Um, for everyone watching, the Google form has now been posted in the YouTube chat box. And um, you have 30 minutes to fill that out. For those of you who uh, might have missed the very beginning, um, we now have four questions on that. So you have to get three out of four of those correct and provide a valid summary in order to get credit. And yeah, thank you so, so much again, Dr. Katz. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone loved it. We have 1300 viewers right now and they're all saying thank you. Awesome, <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh